Beautiful. All right. Um, for the for the new folks, uh, I'm Ryan Harrison. I'm the chief software architect at Amita. Um, I've been with the company for about three years, uh, and in that time, I've covered a lot more than just software architecture. I've covered everything from uh, sort of software architecture, solution architecture, uh, systems architecture, even a little bit of enterprise architecture. Um, early this month, I went for a training for something called TOGAF, which we're going to talk all about for the next hour. Um, and I'm going to share with you uh, what TOGAF is uh, and um, why it is sort of useful for architects to know from a developer perspective. Um, so does anybody care to throw out a definition of architecture or an architect? What, what does an architect do? What is architecture? Anybody? No, nobody, no, no takers. I'd say architecture is the yeah. high level, especially system of flows that make up, well, makes up any system. So components, mm -hmm. data, uh, technology and, and stack and applications that are used in it, possibly depending upon how deep you want to go, maybe even certain parts of process procedure and SOPs. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, James and I run a interview this morning and I told him, uh, architecture is also the, the people who like to come up with ideas, but don't want to actually have to implement any of it. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> uh, any other any other takers on definition for architecture? All right. Um, uh, from from an ISO, two related definitions of architecture. Uh, you can read them side by side. Uh, but the two big things that stand out are uh, systems or the components that make up a system uh, and the principles. So an architect is concerned with uh, principles, that is uh, setting and maintaining uh, principles or guidelines over time um, so that a system evolves in a, um, a, an ideally in a predictable way. Um, and then also saying what the system is. What is the system? What is its components? How are the, what are those interrelationships? And um, everything else kind of goes to the service of setting and maintaining those principles and then defining um, those systems or those system boundaries. Um, so, so thank you for the lead in, uh, Joe, uh, with respect to architects maintaining and designing system boundaries. Uh, and the dev said, I don't need no stinking, no nothing architect. Um, uh, architects can get um, quite a bad rap in the, in the developer community. Um, there's a very well-known uh, anti-pattern um, known as the ivory tower architect, where the architect declares that you know such and such will be so, um, and the development team saying that I don't understand, it's not being communicated to me in a language I understand, or that's just not going to work. Um, because the architect, particularly an enterprise architect, is looking across an entire, you know, it could be a, it could be a, in the case of like the VA, you know, 300,000 person organization. Uh, and the developer is concerned with their, rightly, with their particular system or, or software application. So there can be a big uh, gap of understanding and transparency between the two. Um, and architects are known uh, for sort of spewing off their patterns. Uh, which is what the what the other joke is on the on the right here. Um, so there are dozens of architectural patterns, and an architect will say, you know, to a developer, oh, just use a, um, a scatter gather pattern or something like that. And and the developer is like, okay, well that's nice. How do I actually implement this thing? Um, the second thing an architect does uh, is to define system boundaries. Um, so when you think about the prepends to architect, enterprise architect, system architect, software architect, and also like data architect or solution architect, the other types, uh, you're really talking about scope and level of detail. An enterprise architect is looking across the entire organization. Uh, a system architect is looking across um, you know, one you know, particular uh, system or maybe a, a particular uh, domain, um, like data architecture. And a software architect is concerning themselves with, um, you know, just just a software system. Um, and you can refer to this. I mean, so, so TOGAF has specific language for these different um, levels of abstraction or these levels of detail. 
Um, but you can just refer to them as like level zero, level one, two, three. Um, and if you're, say, coming at it from a data modeling perspective, you could think about this as like, you know, conceptual versus logical versus physical, where you have the conceptual at the highest level and the physical data model at the lowest level. Now, I'm going to give a canonical example of defining these system boundaries. Uh, I, um, before, before the TOGAF, um, back in, I think it was 2019, I gave a talk at uh, one of the care first uh, data forums about architecture and how architecture was being used in doing their data modernization. But from a simple perspective, you have a bunch of a bunch of amorphous blobs, and you're trying to arrange them in a way that makes sense. So you, you kind of start off with a bunch of amorphous blobs. Uh, you group them uh, sort of like with like, um, split them into um, sort of things that can be implemented together. We're going to call them programs. Uh, and then you define sort of boundaries between the, the different programs. And at that point, an enterprise architect would say, all right, I've defined the, 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 the programs, I've defined the components at a very high level, a conceptual level or a strategic level, uh, and now I'm going to hand this off to a system architect to actually you know, say what that system boundary is. So we have um, sort of project A or program A and program B. We're looking at two specific components. Let's call it component A1 and component B2. Um, the enterprise architect has said there's gonna, there should be a system boundary here, but has left it kind of up to the, that lower level architect, system architect, to say what that boundary should be, um, you know, um, and uh, you know, to come to the definition for it. So either the system architect or the enterprise architect can say, all right, we need to we need to say a durable message queue here because that's what meets the requirements. Um, then you can say, OK, there are a bunch of different vendors for durable message queue, so we're going to do some, based on those requirements, we want a durable message queue, we're going to do some text selection. And then um, an input into that text selection is going to be a bunch of design decisions about uh, what you need from your durable message queue, what type of serialization you need, channel structure, dot, dot, dot. Um, and then the system architect can say, all right, I want a durable message queue. I want it to be Kafka-like, uh, so I'm going to go and um, evaluate a bunch of solutions here. Now that I have the architecture in place, I have a durable message queue. Um, I'm going to have some message format. Um, I can go and evaluate a bunch of different vendors uh, and say, I want to go with this one. Uh, and then hand that off to the development team to say, all right, we've selected this, this particular durable message queue, and this is, this is how it will, um, at a lower level of abstraction, tie into the, the piece of software that you're building. I'm following. Okay. So, so now we come to TOGAF. Um, previously, I was using a bunch of, you know, I'm, I'm using you know, language components, system boundaries. Um, TOGAF does a few different things. It gives you a structure and a vocabulary for all the various things going on in an architecture. It gives you uh, a method and a process, which includes governance. Um, that's governance or that's that's governance process both for individual architecture projects and an enterprise as a whole. Uh, it gives you a set of um, uh, like very well defined tools and techniques, uh, most of which are borrowed from other other disciplines. So if you're looking for a particular view or a particular way of representing something, you can kind of go through TOGAF and say, oh, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I can pull a uh, a radar diagram that shows capability maturity, for example, and apply that to my project. Uh, and then finally, um, the output of sort of doing these, you know, component A and the, the system boundary analysis, et cetera, is a set of building blocks, architecture building blocks and solution building blocks. Where architecture building blocks um, define the sort of the requirements and um, the thing that is to be built. Uh, and the solution architecture defines it's sort of exactly how you build it. So. The architecture building block would say durable message queue, and the solution building block would say I'm going to implement it in AWS, uh, 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 like uh, yeah, MKS. Um, TOGAF is a framework. Um, it's um, it would be sort of for any for any given enterprise, it's, it, you're not just going to apply TOGAF in isolation. Um, those enterprises are also going to have frameworks for other business functions. Um, and here I'm showing the relationship between three of them. Uh, PMBOK, which is the Project Management Book of Knowledge, which is, your, which is the sort of framework for PMs. Um, ITIL, 
um, which is uh, sort of the IT configuration uh, framework and COVID, which is an IT governance framework. So an enterprise is going to say, I'm going to take um, some of these processes from TOGAF, and I'm going to take some of these processes from PMBOK, I'm going to take some of these processes from ITIL, I'm going to have some processes imposed upon me by um, various ISOs or, or high trust or high tech, and that will become sort of the, the, the framework that's tailored to a specific enterprise. Um, so this is a, I guess, a theoretical view of how enterprise architecture would fit into an enterprise. Um, you have your, your business planning people, which say, um, over the next five years, I want to you know, better serve the citizens of North Carolina or do broadband modernization or whatever the, the high level business objective is going to be. Um, the enterprise architecture function says, OK, um, we get those high level principles um, over the next you know, three to five years. We're going to decompose that and say how those high level principles map to uh, a baseline architecture, a target architecture, and then transition architectures at every step in between. Um, we're then going to communicate that to project management so they can maintain the project roadmap. And we're also going to communicate that architectural direction to operations management so that they can actually run the business uh, at each of those transitions. And then for the things that actually get built, we're going to communicate um, what each individual team uh, needs to build uh, so that we can complete this sort of hole that business planning wants to do, which is the communication to the solution development team. Um, so on this diagram, um, or in the way that X TOGAF imagines things, um, there is a separation between the architecture function and the development function. The architecture function sort of gives the building plans and the implementation team just implements. Um, and then obviously, you know, PMs uh, would be in the bottom box. And then the business um, are going to be a combination of, the, I guess, the business planning box and the operations management boxes. Um, when you're talking about enterprise architecture frameworks, uh, you might have heard uh, Zachman uh, batted around. Um, in terms of uh, like broadly applicable enterprise architecture frameworks, uh, TOGAF and Zachman are really the only games in town. Um, large enterprises will define their own architecture frameworks. Um, so the Department of Defense has their own architecture framework, uh, which TOGAF um, actually has, shares a common lineage with. Uh, the Veterans Affairs has an architecture framework. HHS has an architecture framework. Um, but they're really, um, you, you, could, you could think about TOGAF as a superset, and then you're applying the sort of the organization-specific archite architecture framework on top of TOGAF. Um, the important difference between Zachman and TOGAF is that Zachman is structure only, and TOGAF is structure plus method. Um, so Zachman would say, uh, here's a grid, and we want views uh, for each of these things, uh, but it will not tell you how to accomplish it. It'll say, all right, we want you know a conceptual what view or entity relationship model. It won't tell you how to do it. It won't tell you uh, the process of going about developing an architecture. Uh, where TOGAF gives you both the structure and a defined process uh, for going about uh, making the architecture. Questions about architecture frameworks versus TOGAF? Nope, I think we're good. And I've had the benefit of hearing some of those. Oh, there. So to define and enforce the set of principles and to define system boundaries, uh, architecture comes down to people, process, and technology. Uh, you can think about this bottom up or top down. The top down view is the business wants to accomplish some principles. You have a business architecture, which defines the people involved, the organizational structure, and the processes involved. Um, these can be encoded on like a swim lane diagram. That business architecture is then realized through an application architecture and a data architecture. The application architecture would be viewed uh, from like um, component diagrams. For example, that would show you the software components that are going to accomplish each business function, each business process. And then a data architecture, which would define the data models and the data elements used 
um, to carry out a specific business process. And then finally, you have a technology architecture. This is your, this is your networking requirements. Um, uh, this is your firewall rules, dot, 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 your, your physical hardware um, that underlie both the application and data architecture. So uh, for example, a data architect would say, all right, uh, I'm going to define conceptual uh, and logical data models. I'm going to hand that off to a, uh, a database administrator uh, to implement in Postgres. But the data architect wouldn't really be concerned with the, I guess, the, the scalability of the databases. That would be a technology architecture decision. And that would be the handoff. Because you can define the, the data models uh, without, um, for the most part, without, without diving too deep into how you're actually going to gonna scale the thing. That would be technology architecture. All right. The heart of TOGAF. Uh, is this thing called the ADM, the Architecture Development Method. Um, now, I'm going to talk through this, and I'm going to need you to su suspend your disbelief, because um, when, you, when you go through it, you're going to be like, that's not how things actually work in an organization. Um, but in the TOGAF view, you have an Architecture Development Method with these very concrete phases, uh, preliminary, A through H, and then this requirements management phase that sits in the middle. For each phase in the architecture development method, um, there are specific deliverables associated with them, uh, which we'll get into later, and specific outcomes and tasks that are supposed to happen. Um, now, this architecture development method is contrived, and it doesn't actually happen like this in real life, but it's really useful for decomposing a problem. Let's say you're a, a data architect, and you're presented with a, a sort of a big ball of wax. Um, the, your, 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 um, your executive stakeholders are asking for five or six different things, and you just don't know where to start. You can use this very structured architecture development method to decompose the problem. So here goes the theory. In the preliminary phase, um, a executive stakeholder would issue a request for architecture work, uh, which is going to say, here's some principles, and here's a thing that I want you architects to get done. Um, this could be a memo, this could be an email, there's a request. That request is then received by the architecture department or the architecture team and kicks off the ADM cycle A through H. In phase A, the architecture team says, okay, I get your request for architecture. We're going to define what that means. And we're going to do two things. We're going to, def we're going to define an architecture vision and we're going to define a statement of architecture work. The architecture vision uh, restates the principles. The statement of architecture work defines the scope of what the architecture is going to perform. The architects then go back with their statement of architecture work, which defines the scope in terms of breadth and timeline, uh, and says, you know, we, we heard your architecture request. This is what we're planning to do. These are the outcomes that you should expect. And this is how long it's going to take. Um, we'll see you in two months. After the statement of architecture work is agreed upon with the executive stakeholder, you continue on to phases uh, B, C, and D. So the theory here is you go top down. You start with your business architecture. You define your current business architecture, or your baseline business architecture as the TOGAF language. And you define your target business architecture. And you go to information systems which incorporates both application data architecture. You can do these in either order. You define your baseline application architecture, your baseline data architecture, and then you define your target application architecture, your target data architecture. Same thing for technology architecture. Within each of these phases, BCD, there is a prescriptive sort of step-by-step -step guide of what you should do, which is shown here. Create the baseline. Um, consider the views that you need to represent the baseline to your various stakeholders, create your architecture model, um, select uh, your architecture services, and then and so forth and so forth. At the end of phases B, C, and D, your output is going to be an architecture definition document. This architecture def definition document at this point only has the baseline architectures and, their, and the views representing them and your target architecture and the views representing them. At this point, um, 
according to the Togaf philosophy, there is no um, there's no view as to transitions. There's no view as to uh, specific solutions that you would use to implement the architecture. So it's very waterfally. You say what you're going to do. You define the architecture. Then in phases E and F, you say the solutions that you're going to use to accomplish that architecture. So in phases E and F, you would um, map out the transition steps that you would need to do to go from uh, baseline to target. Those transition architecture steps and the views that represent the transitions are put into the architecture design document. It's appended. Uh, in phase E, uh, you would uh, figure out which solutions you're going to use to implement the architecture. So if, if uh, in, 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 uh, in phase um, C for the data architecture, you said that you're going to need uh, some sort of data model, uh, you would actually pick a vendor to implement that data model in. you uh, would define an architecture roadmap, which basically says these are the, the architecture solution building blocks and the dependencies, but not on a timeline. And then finally, you would have, uh, you create a, a timeline uh, called an implementation and migration plan, uh, which would take those architecture and solution building blocks and sort of phase them out on a timeline that a PM could actually use. And all of those things, those like three or four things are outputs of phase F. Then. There is a waterfally handoff to the implementation team. Here's where you come in, developers. Um, you'll get a packet of information, which is your architecture definition document, your architecture roadmap, and the implementation plan. And the architect will say, thou shalt build. And the only role, according to Togaf, of the architect in phase G um, is to make sure that the developers are building according to plan. Um, you can think about this like a like a like a, a a building architect or a building inspector. The architect, the building architect, says this is how the electrical system should be built, how the plumbing system should be built, and then there are a set of inspections, you know, by the local county that that confirms that the electrical is roughed in properly, the electrical is finished properly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so according to Togaf, the architect is is divorced from the implementation team and is there to just kind of confirm that the implementation team is building according to this uh, sort of magical plan that the architect has uh, created. You can see my skepticism coming in now. Um, the final phase is phase H. Um, the system is, is now built, uh, and you're doing change management. Maybe the architect didn't get things right, um, so there are some changes that are going to be needed. And then that sort of the, the changes that are going to be needed are going to be sort of rolled into requirements, and that's going to kick off a new request for architecture, which will start the cycle all over again. Um, so that is the, the TOGAF architecture development method. Very prescriptive, um, very waterfally, um, predates Agile. Um, doesn't necessarily play so well with Agile. There are people working on sort of TOGAF and Agile and how they work together, but they, they're not really designed to play well together. And the thought is that you, you go around this in, in cycles. And, and we'll, we'll talk about later is like a defined way that you can you can do these cycles to, to, to navigate the ABM method. Uh, questions about the architecture development method. So other than there not being a baseline, is there a distinction in the process where it's a uh, new basics, a, ba a new system versus a iteration on an existing system? That's the first question. Not really. Um, so uh, TOGAF kind of has, um, when you're looking at BCD, they kind of have two high-level ways of going about it, a baseline first and a target first. Uh, if you have an existing baseline, um, that might bias you towards a baseline first architecture um, approach. And if you don't have a baseline, you're just really imagining the future state and you you're, you're just do target and you won't do a baseline since there's not a, you know, you don't have a place that you're starting with. So greenfield development would be target first. Okay. And... Uh... How would you personify, uh, it's difficult for me to describe, but try to come up with it, um, vendor or department A has an architecture, it's well-defined mm -hmm. as far as they ever are, um, and vendor B or department B is utilizing arbitrarily, because it's the most common, the data architecture from there to retrieve data, but otherwise it's a completely independent application or architecture. Mm 
how would you integrate the architecture from the other application into the design process for the independent application? So um, TOGAF, the TOGAF way of doing this would say, um, within an architecture definition document, you have a you, you can have a bunch of different architectures defined. You would take your architecture building block just for the data and reuse it. Okay. So you basically pull the, the you basically pull the data architecture section out of the architecture definition document for team A and hand it off to team B and reuse the same thing. Got it. Thank you. And then otherwise the, the architectures would, would evolve separately. Got it. And TOGAF has, we'll get to it in a few slides, TOGAF has a whole methodology for how organizations should maintain their requirements repository, their architecture repositories, their solution building block repositories, et cetera. So very prescriptive. Um, I heard, I can't, I can't actually see the message. Let's go. Oh, Chris. Hey, I'll put my hand down. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm new to Amida, and I don't know the history of projects around this. So um, is TOGAF something that has been used within Amida on uh, prior projects? Are there artifacts that we already have established as, um, you know, I, this is a preferred methodology and framework that Amida likes, and so we've built templates and, and so gotcha. forth? So, yep, no, no and no. Um, so um, TOGAF is really applied at the like large enterprise level. So if you're the VA, um, say in the early 2000s, you would say we're going to build an enterprise architecture function and use TOGAF for it. Um, so where TOGAF comes in handy for Amita is understanding the architecture frameworks of the very large enterprises that we serve. You know, the, the North Carolina DHHSs, the Care First, the VAs, et cetera. Um, in terms of, um, I guess you call them these architecture building blocks, we've done architecture on a bunch of projects and we have, um, for those projects, we have um, you know, um, um, like conceptual and logical architectures for them. And because we do so many, um, like I guess, data modernization projects, we can, we can pull like three or four different conceptual architectures that have described how Amita recommended you know, doing uh, a data architecture at these various firms as a part of their subtly different modernization things. So it's not formalized. We don't have a formal architecture repo, but we do have sort of architecture artifacts from from all the architecture projects that we've been involved with for like data modernizations that you know care first at all. Got it. Thanks. All right. With TOGAF being very prescriptive, um, there are roughly 30 different deliverables that TOGAF specifies. Um, these are probably, these are the most important ones. Um, and what these deliverables will allow you to do is to help untangle the ball of wax. So you've been giving a bunch of competing uh, priorities from your, from your stakeholder that screams for a statement of architecture work. You're, 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 there are, TOGAF has templates, you know, 20 pages long. You're probably not going to use the whole template. But you know you can take some of the things in that template and say, what I need to do here is I need to define for my stakeholder what I plan to do by when. Um, likewise, uh, if you are focused just on, say, data architecture and you don't have a baseline available to you, um, you know that um, you can reach for this architecture definition document and views related to data and you know, start building from there. It gives you a way to start untangling the ball of wax by using these artificial deliverables and this artificial process so you can actually start making some headway and not be paralyzed by, oh my God, I don't know what my stakeholder wants me to do. You kind of take in the guidance and then you tell them based on their guidance what you're going to do and you kind of get their approval at each one of these deliverables. Um, so, you can think about it as a, as a, as a, for the deliverables, you can think about it as a, as a, if you're, if you're not a TOGAF fan, a garbage bag, uh, or if you are a TOGAF fan, a library of these deliverables that you can pull for. And likewise, there is a library of, um, sort of architectures you can pull for the views, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, the ADM also defines uh, sort of scoping. The four dimensions of scope being breadth, depth, time period, and architecture domain. And you would actually define these in your statement of architecture work. Your uh, your your um your executive stakeholder says, "All right, I want some architecture done," and then you say, "All right, uh, we're going to um, define this as only the data architecture. We're going to go, I guess, to the logical level. We're going to do it in a month, et cetera, et cetera." And you can kind of um, uh, also know what level of the enterprise you're working with, whether you're doing things at the enterprise or strategic level, the segment level, the capability level. And those roughly map very roughly to conceptual, logical, and physical. Not really, but it's some it's a rough equivalence. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a toolbox to help you decompose a problem. And it gives you a language to talk about sort of the architecture domains. You, ha you have uh, four defined architecture domains with definitions for each one, so you can see where you're talking about. Um, uh, in terms of depth, you have you know, enterprise segment and capability, so you can kind of still, wh wh what are we talking about? Are we talking about a capability for one system? Are we talking about um, something a segment that's going to cross multiple systems and that's going to be reused? Are we talking about an enterprise uh, strategy that then has to be decomposed into segments? So it's really about vocabulary and language. And finally, for the ADM, um, you don't have to go around the entire cycle. Um, you can, you can, you can, you can break it down. You say, "All right, we have this ADM cycle, and I'm going to do iterations focusing on different things." So if I have a really, really unclear scope, um, I can, I can define the. Um, the breadth is, say, the this entire department. I can define the depth as strategic, and I can go around the cycle and kind of define a very a strategic conceptual architecture that just gets the main stakeholders agreeing on principles, and that'll be the first iteration. And then I can do another iteration where I'm focused, you know, specifically on this one data modernization effort, and I'm, I'm focused on sort of um, figuring out what the ba what the baseline data architecture is. And then I can do a third architecture where I can do a third iteration where um, uh, it's kind of an, uh, an ENF with procurement. So I know that I have to go through this really cumbersome government procurement cycle. So it might be wasteful for me to actually go and evaluate specific solutions since I have to bid it out anyway. So my ENF, my transition planning has now become sort of writing or helping contracting write a contract to bid out the actual solution. Um, so you can, you, can, you can use this sort of very contrived ADM cycle to um, focus you and your team upon what the, um, what the expected inputs and expected outputs are. And sort of the, the four main cycles that you're going to have is sort of architecture development, this transition planning when you're doing solutioning, um, the governance, where you are um, making sure that what the developers are building is uh, conforming to what you think, or if you were wrong, you go and update your architecture plans based on the new information from the developers, and then planning for the next iteration. And you can you can think about this as like nesting dolls. You're going to have iterations that have like a I'd say a year long or two year long time scale happening at the strategic level, at the same time where you might have iterations lasting one uh, two weeks, which is where you kind of can get into like you can see the uh, the connection with sprints you're gonna have you know one sprint two weeks two sprints you know one month going over a cycle at a much lower level of abstraction at the capability or segment level um, togaf has a bunch of tools and techniques um, if you can think of a diagram um, there's a good chance that TOGAF has a formal description with an example of the diagram. Um, and those diagrams cross you know, um, all the different types of architecture. And they come in the forms of you know, matrices, uh, tables, and figures. So concrete example. Um, let's say that I am doing a project related to interoperability. Um, TOGAF has a section or chapter on interoperability requirements. 
uh, it has definitions of um, the different um, types of exchanges and then different subtypes of exchanges. Um, and you can sort of, you can use the degree of exchange as a maturity model and the type of exchange as a descriptor. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, likewise for gap analysis, which we have all done, um, you can pull a, a template or a table that says, all right, here's, um, you know, here's how you do gap analysis and kind of here's a check, here's a checklist. Here's some, here's some tables and here's a checklist of things that you should do when you're doing a gap analysis. But it, it serves as a reference and as a refresher or a grab bag library or a uh, garbage can, depending on what your view is. Uh, if you are, um, say you're at working at the strategic level uh, and the mandate is, you know, figure out um, what systems we should keep versus which systems we should get rid of. Um, but you're doing it from a sort of a business perspective. You can do this with a business value tech business value assessment technique. And again, there's a chapter that says, uh, well, a couple pages that says, here's how you do business value assessment techniques. Here's, why it's, here's how it's useful. Here are the stakeholders that might be interested in this, et cetera, et cetera. Very prescriptive definitions. Um, and it's really useful if you're thinking like, oh man, I have this, this, this architecture idea or this principle I want to communicate. Um, you can basically look up examples of, you know, sort of templates of how you would communicate them. And the idea is um, that over time, the organization would build up a library of these uh, views and viewpoints so they can reuse them across projects. So there would be an Amido, so not Amido, there would be a, um, a VA way of doing a business value assessment diagram, or there would be a VA way of doing a transition planning matrix, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Related to this concept of, of having a reusable architecture building blocks and solution building blocks, um, Togath envisions um, sort of a, 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 an architecture continuum that's a library uh, where you have architectures that you will reuse. Um, you have your foundation architectures. Um, that's where Togath would sit. That's where the DOD architecture framework would sit. Um, you have sort of your common system architectures, your industry architectures, and finally your organization-specific architectures. And within a very large enterprise, you actually might have multiple tiers of organization-specific architectures. Um, so if you think about HHS, for example, um, HHS has an overall um, uh, architecture framework, but HHS also has like an architecture or a strategic plan for AI and a strategic plan for Medicaid reimbursement modernization, et cetera. And the idea is um, a team um, could pull architecture building blocks from those strategic proposals and then um, you know, decompose them into those segments and then reuse the, reuse the architecture building blocks across um, strategic proposals, across segments, and across capabilities. And finally, um, These things where I'm talking about ADM iteration and tools and techniques are useful for uh, like individual architecture projects. The building blocks is where you start to, 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 to lean into how this looks across an organization. And the prescriptive definition of the enterprise continuum says at an organization level, this is VA architecture, this is how you should structure it. These are the components of a enterprise architecture organization uh, at a large enterprise. Uh, so if you take a VA example, um, the VA maintains uh, sort of a, a standards information base, which says that these are the standards that we have, and here are the specific technologies um, that would accommodate with those standards. So there's a standards base that VA has, and it's a, there's a reference um, a, a reference library of solutions. You might think about that as like the TRM. Um, there's a repository for solutions. There's a repository for architectures at different levels. Um, there's an enterprise architecture board with very prescriptive like ways of running it. I mean, TOGAF actually goes down to the level of how the enterprise architecture board should run a meeting. Um, so it's it's um, if you were a large enterprise, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 people, and you were wanting to stand up an enterprise architecture function, you can use uh, TOGAF as a playbook for actually structuring the enterprise architecture function within your organization. 
and um, defining contracts, not for individual engagements, but contracts with the with the business of this is what enterprise architecture should do. These are the performance metrics of enterprise architecture for, you know, the the uh, the PMs and for the the business planning people and for the operations people. Um, where this is useful for developers um, is knowing what to ask for. So if your organization is following something TOGAFI, um, they should have a standards base. They should have a reference library. They should have a solutions repository. They should have some place that they're storing their requirements. Um, so knowing if you're talking to like a TOGAF architect, you can say, all right, what are you using as your reference library? Or what are you using as your standard information base? And be able to get to that information just because you're, you're using um, the vocabulary that you both understand. But otherwise, um, just this, 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 the concept of the enterprise continuum is really for um, implementing TOGAF at an organization. It's not so applicable to an individual developer. The stuff that's applicable to an individual developer are this grab bag of tools and techniques that you can use. Uh, and also um, the concept of sort of scoping and iteration. So you can go back to your architect and say, um, you know, this isn't defined in these other iteration, or you can kind of, you can, you can, you can, you can, in the TOGAF, you trigger another architecture, like roundabout based on something that you might need. All right, coming full circle. At the very beginning of the talk, uh, we talked about system boundaries. We called things, you know, programs and components. With TOGAF, we have a we have names for things and we have process. So now I'm a system architect, and I'm going to be doing a transition planning iteration. That's by me, with a scope that's going to be defined in the statement of architecture work. I have specific deliverables where I know to define things. The system boundary is going to be defined in the architecture definition document. Um, the, the text selection is going to be in this phase E, and I have a prescriptive way of going about it. Um, the requirements management is going to be in this requirements management phase, and that requirements management phase is going to have um, you know, these, you know, the, the reference library, the standards information base, um, and the architecture landscape where I can pull things to and contribute to. Um, I'll know that I might need to get an approval before this goes to a client, which goes into this architecture board and governance stuff. And I can go into this, as I'm doing the architecture, I can go into this grab bag of tools and I can say, all right, this doable message queue, I'm going to reuse this. This is a segment architecture. I'm going to reuse this across projects. So I'm going to make an architectural building block, which has some views in it. And then I might have selected MKS, so I'm going to do a solution building block off of that with some sequence diagrams specific for MKS. And I can have views that I can pull basically right out of TOGAF, the templates, for the various stakeholders that I might need, the PMs, the component developers, and the network engineers. Um, so you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it now with, I guess, uh, terminology and definitions and formalization. And that is, that's TOGAF. I know, I know it's a lot. Um, and I know that the prescriptiveness is, a, is a turn off, uh, or can be a turn off. But you if you think about it as a grab bag of tools and a structure where you can kind of take what is useful, um, then that's how I would see sort of TOGAF being used at a meetup by like the data architecture team. We have a follow up with this to the with the the data architecture group, especially, but out of curiosity, a couple of questions. One, um, and, and this may touch on uh, directly or indirectly on a few other questions we talked about um, the the baseline and then. What I'll call well, well you called the target state is there um, when how do they handle um, multiple iterations uh, to get to a next state? Often you'll have a a, a kind of uh, target state and then even a future state. Um, or at least implementation in kind of phases one, two, and three. How do they handle that with the TOGAF uh, cycle there? Um, you do you do ne you do nesting. So um, at any given time, you might have a, an enterprise like a. Uh, I was going to use the term burr, 
uh, bottom-up review from the from the military, but I'm not going to go there. Um, you might have an enterprise level strategic architecture that's going to take a year, and then you might define, you might decompose that into um, segments. So you have a data architecture segment and a technology architecture segment, and then you de might decompose that into capabilities. And all of those things are going to be running at the same time, and they'll be and passing um, sort of these architecture building blocks between each other. That's that's yes, the way that. Is is there a is there a point where that is um, inappropriate to do at a certain level or not in terms of would would any of those um, uh, on the wheel there uh, would would that be appropriate for every level from the enterprise all the way down to the detail level or is that something where they would recommend that you only really have one target architecture at the enterprise level and that it would be more at the data or technology or, or other levels where you would do multiple iterations to get to the target state, if the question makes sense. Um, it's when, when you're going down from enterprise to segment to capability, it's, it's the level of detail. So um, if, if you want to get really big picture, um, if you look across the VA as an enterprise, uh, something like EHRM might be a box on a on a like on a on a on a on an enterprise level component diagram diagram but there's a lot that goes into ehrm so in the toga view the box on the enterprise diagram that that might be your target state you're going to go from vista to ehrm using cerner and that and that's that's your enterprise architecture at that level you then decompose that into you know various segment architectures they're going to be a segment around data mapping there's going to be a segment around um, sort of um, retiring the data centers within um, VA hospitals. And then you can think about the capability as how we're actually going to implement this plan at each individual site. Um, and the time scales will differ. So the so that enterprise diagram, the target state being HRM, that might be valid for 10 years. Um, the cap at the capability level, you're going to be updating your, your migration plan and process at each tranche of sites that you do. And then within each site, you're going to have a transition plan of how you're walking things over from uh, Vista to Cerner. In terms of the takeaways for developers, um, if you're in an organization, if you're in an organization, um, know that inter the enterprise architecture function will have a bunch of uh, figures and, and diagrams. So if you find yourself trying to reconstruct a baseline architecture, um, it might be that the architecture team already has one, so you don't have, so you don't have to do that work. Um, if you find yourself for want of sort of an architecture roadmap, uh, it might be that the architecture team actually has one. Maybe 